Chapter 12 The year-end festivities were over, and the blessed were preparing for the trip back to the manor. The weather had turned wet enough that they had decided it was safer to use one of Selene's traveling vessels, so they sent a message to Captain Hank by Messenger Bird. The seas, while rough, were safer than the snow-blown roads, and with the newly made docks at the manor house, they could sail right to the shore. They were to set sail with the tide, but that night, when lying in their beds on the mainland, there was a sudden sweep of conciseness, and all six of them were sitting in a dream trance around the table. They looked at each other. Well, this is odd, Evelyn admitted, and they all agreed. Adeline was no stranger to prophecies, so she looked around carefully. She had found that the setting often gave hints to the meanings of dreams and prophecies. Seven throne-like chairs surrounded the round table. Each chair was different. Matilda's chair was the most defined. A dark mahogany wood etched with animal runes. Prairie cats were at the arms, and the top was a roaring bear. Nyal's was black marble and looked like the stars. Selene's was a clash between the sea and flames. Elblin's continually changed in a dark fog. Aubrey's was blank, and Adeline's was filled with flowers and vines. The seventh and most ornate chair, she thought, had to be Nalina's. It was the most weathered, crisscrossed with burn marks, and it looked like the seat was worn to the person who sat in it, whereas Adeline's butt was already hurting. The room itself was dark. They could have had a wall on an inch behind their chairs, or they could have had been on top of the world. It was impossible to tell. Then Adeline looked down at the table. Look at the patterns on here. What do you see? Selene leaned forward and glanced down as well. The round table showed the world. The shape of mountains and the dips of the valleys were easy to see. Some areas showed rain, others snow. The ocean was a rolling mass of waves. It was fascinating and hypnotic to watch, but slowly, trickling like smoke from a slow-burning fire, blackness was starting low in the kingdoms. She traced the patterns with her fingers. It felt frozen and thick. Darkness, swallowing up the land, she stated with a puzzled frown. Nial followed suit. I see all the kingdoms being affected. Death and despair, Matilde hissed grimly. Look up, whispered Aubrey. They all looked up, and then as one threw themselves back so hard that if the chairs weren't part of the floor, they would have been on the ground. Spiders. Hundreds of thousands of them were crawling in cobwebs above their heads. Adeline gagged, clutching her stomach with a shudder, grimacing as the spiders dropped to the table. They began to crawl across the table and sink down into the earth of the table. Oh my god, that's disgusting, and such a bad omen. Evelyn leaned closer as the spiders crawled over the table. Everything they touch turns to dust and decay. What do you think this means? They all knew, but no one wanted to be the first to breathe the word. Plague The six of them looked across the table to the source of the deep whisper. Standing there was the god of death. All shied from him except for Adeline, who smiled shyly at him as she stood to curtsy deeply. The god of death was the one god that would claim them all one day. As immortals, the idea of death was hard for them to swallow, but Adeline's mindset was different because of her powers. Lord, she said from her curtsy before standing straight again. The black shadow that was death slid through the table, and the others scrambled to their feet to bow. But while they were bowing, everyone was also backing away. Adeline was the only one who stayed still as he took her hand. It was cold. Frozen cold, but she didn't back away from fear. He turned and motioned to the table where the spiders were now consuming the table itself. Prepare for it, dearest. Many will be coming to my realm soon. But you six can put a stop to it. Use your powers and the power of the seventh to save Atrula. His voice was cold like a sharp northern breeze, and with it came the scent of dying the sickly sweet smell of dead flesh and sickrum. He slowly faded out. The spiders faded as well, and with alarm, the others looked at each other as they too faded to grey. Adeline woke slowly and sat up, burying her head in her hands. Across the castle, the others were having similar reactions. Celine leapt from her bed, wanting to grab a weapon, but this wasn't an enemy she could fight with a sword. She put clothing on, 
and as she bolted out of her room, she also ran smack dab into Nial, also clothed and heading out the door like her. Mathilde was already racing to Aubrey and Evelyn's cottage. The five instantly clasped hands in a circle on the ground and began to probe, casting far to hunt for the scent of despair. By the time Adeline got to the cottage from her room in the castle, the others had hunted over all the lands and had stopped casting to discuss. A little bit of darkness in the north and in the Iceland's north, Evelyn summarized for Adeline. It seems like it might just be a small cold starting it, but it's too far away for us to cast, even with all of us trying. All six of us can cast that far. Join me, Adeline said as she sat down and took Niall's hand and slid into the meditation with him probing far away. In her mind's eye, she sailed above the clouds and saw the darkness coming from the far corner of the Icelands. As she was watching from above, it began to trickle, throbbing hard and slowly moving south. She could feel Nial and Aubrey. How can we stop it? We can't contain it in the Icelands. It's too far, Nial thought back to her. They circled it, probing, but it was something deep and dark and powerful. It felt oddly strong, almost like the power of another blessed. Why would another blessed cast a plague curse? A plague curse? Aubrey asked in wonderment. I can't think of any of them wanting to do it. Since the last war, they have retired their gifts and lived in peace. Do you think Nalina missed the count on one of them that survived to want to seek revenge? Adeline asked. Let's regroup, Aubrey told them, and they all drifted back into their own bodies. Once they were back awake and the lamps were lit, they were able to start planning. Aubrey walked out of the room to retrieve something. Adeline started first. Okay, ideas? Aubrey returned and spread a map of Vetrila on the floor between them. It looked to be starting here in the Icelands, Aubrey pointed out to the only large city in the Icelands, located on the far northwest side of the kingdom. Njal rubbed his neck and glared at the map. Aye, and that's the busiest trading hub right now. It's going to be everywhere before we get a chance to alert anyone. Adeline nibbled on her lip. Okay, so I think we should definitely contact Lady Nalina and appraise her of the situation. Do you think we can have a place to keep safe from the plague? Nyal hesitated. I don't think that's smart to do that, he glanced at Aubrey. He's right. Look, I know you guys want to protect your kingdoms. However, at this moment, you need to remember you were not princesses first. You were blessed. And every person on these planes are our responsibilities, Aubrey said. Celine nodded. That's true. And with only two true healer types here, we are going to need all the help we can possibly get. We will all have to work together to keep everyone we can alive. Well, maybe Manilina could keep a barrier up herself, Adeline offered tentatively, still wanting to protect as many people as possible. I don't know. Even if she can't project far, so it would be the manor house. Selene pointed out from where she still sat on the floor. Matilda was petting her cat, hesitantly, thoughtfully. One way or another, Nalina has to be told. Maybe she can stop it in its tracks. They all agreed at this and rejoined their circle. Their powers flowed through, their, through them and gathered until they were able to pulse out and feel for Nalina. Her energy was a rich, creamy gold. And unlike her young protégés, Nelina did not need a med to meditate to connect her mind to them. She was literally in the middle of a meeting with her villagers when she felt them touch her mind. She slipped away mentally, allowing a portion of her to remain present with her villagers. Yes, she asked her students. They explained the situation, and Nelina felt a deep-seated sense of fear. All the other blessed that were alive never would bother with the plague. They lived in their own imposed exiles and rejoiced in that. If there was a blessed behind the plague, it was a new blessed. All other blessed had been killed in the war. She hid it from her students. What form has this plague taken? A cold, my lady. The common cold, Adeline told her. I see. Has anyone else been told? No. Nalina sighed in relief. Excellent. First, the royalty all have to be told. We need to reach out to our allies. Adeline, you need to tell your father. I will send riders through the land, but each royal house must tell their own people to avoid chaos. Now conserve your strengths. You'll need them. 
Mathilde, you need to return to the manor where you can be safe. Once they all came back into their own bodies, they stared at each other's eyes and still held their hands, and then they each sat back and Mathilde ran her hand over her hair, still wild from her sleep. Well, I guess we'd better get moving, she finally stated. Take my ship still, Mathilde. I'll send a letter to Hank for the trading company to cease all travel and sail from my place in Dala. They can remain on ships for two weeks. As long as there are no sign of illness, they can then leave the ships. Celine stood and helped Adeline up as well. Thanks, Celine, Mathilde said, discouraged that she was being sent away from the danger. Aubrey took her hand. Do not worry, Mathilde. Soon enough you will be in the front line for danger, but this isn't a danger we can fight head on. Mathilde smiled up at the taller girl. I, I know, but it just bothers me that you will stay in the front line while I have to hide. We'll need you to keep our minds healthy. We'll meditate daily together, and we will need your support there. Adeline nervously ran her hands along her arm, lightly scratching herself as her eyes became haunted. We will all have to support each other. This is not going to be easy, Nial said. They all nodded, splitting into their own groups to do what needed to be done. Adeline walked towards the closed door, behind which King Bernard was in a council meeting, and with a slight arch of her eyebrow, the guard opened it with a flourish. Although it was a closed meeting, when she walked in, especially when she waited with folded hands until they were finished talking. Princess Adeline, the guard announced after the speaker had finished his sentence. Adeline, what are you doing here? King Bernard asked as his daughter walked to the end of the large table. She dipped her head. Pardon my interruption, father, gentlemen, but I have rather unpleasant news that is going to change the choices for Westhold. General Ulfric straightened from his spot of honor to the right side of the king's chair. A war? he asked nearly eagerly, leaning forward to stare at her. Plague. The word caused an uproar that had to be silenced before further discussion was possible. Adeline, that is not something to joke about. I know, father. And I am not joking. The blessed was given a vision by the god of death. She paused and prepared herself. A plague will hit the lands of Vetrula and cause an untold amount of death. It will be unstoppable for a time because it has been cast by an unknown sorcerer. We will stay and help where we can, but you need to prepare, father. The room erupted in outrage again. Silence! No one will leave this room until we have protocols in place. We do not want to terrify the people into a panic. King Bernard ordered them all and nodded at Adeline. If you'll excuse us, Adeline, I will ask none of you to speak to anyone. Adeline nodded. Yes, father. But I will warn you that Mathilde has been ordered back to the manor, so she is boarding Celine's vessel now and carries a letter for the captain of the ship as well as King Regan of Dala. Not being of your jurisdiction, the others are also making their own preparations. Even though Adeline spoke softly, her father started to protest. Father, even me coming to you isn't required. The blessed sense dark work afoot, the work of a sorcerer, not of nature. And we have started taking measures. We will serve the people, but we will do it our way. I'll leave you to your meeting, father, and we'll be waiting to talk to you after. She bowed and exited the room. As she walked, Adeline relaxed her mind, allowing her to reach out and check on what everyone was doing. Matilde stood with her two cats at the helm of the Rosy Vengeance, watching the city fade as they sailed south to the manor. The other four were resting as suggested, preparing themselves for a difficult couple of weeks. Over the next couple of weeks, the rest of the kingdoms of Etrula prepared for the plague. Captain Hank had already dropped Matilde off and had sailed to Dala. King Regan grounded all the ships exactly where they were, on shore or off. The borders were closed. Following suit, Drela, the Heartlands, and the Deserts also closed theirs. But in Westholt, because there were no cases, no precautions were taken. The Blessed could sense the sickness surrounding them. In a meditative meeting with Nelina, she guided them. Patience, Nelina had whispered. Whoever has cast this wants it to slip under the radar. Save your energies and prepare yourselves. The five of them were summoned to a council meeting. It has been over a week since you caused chaos in the world, and yet I see no signs of the plague. How do you defend yourself? King Bernard asked coldly from the head of the council table. 
Adeline was not used to being questioned or scolded by her father in front of others, so she stood rather embarrassed and chastised. But before she could speak, Celine spoke up. Nothing. We have given you a warning and blessed you with our presence in a time that will greatly affect your kingdom for the worst. Celine stood saucy with her legs spread in her pants and her arms folded. Please remember, Princess Celine, you were only invited here on the good will of our king as a companion of our own princess. You were secondary. General Ulfric summed up the opinion of the council. Nial straightened to his rather awkward height. You will speak to God's blessed with the respect we are deserved, or we will all leave General Ulfric. You weren't warned enough of this last month? Celine didn't take her eyes off the general, nor did he take his eyes off hers. It was a battle of wits. When she spoke, her voice was cold. Would you rather I leave, General? Remember that with me goes my trading company, and probably the goodwill of my uncle, the King of Dala? General Ulfric shrugged. You aren't as important as you think, Princess Celine. Adeline lost her temper. In a moment of unadulterated rage, the force of her emotions shoved her blessed to the side. And as she walked forward, the council members shrank from her, even her father, cowering before her. Her eyes, soulless brown as her power, forced Ulfric to duck his head from her as she leaned over him. Speak to Selene like that again, and I will personally take offense to it. Understood? When Ulfric looked in her eyes, he saw his death. And he finally saw not the young girl he had watched grow up, but a god and he nearly wet himself as her full divinity shone through. The room became very still, and the blessed frozen with worry. Evelyn stepped forward and laid her hand gently on Adeline's arm. Addie, it's okay. We are here with you. Adeline blinked very slowly, her eyes returning to light brown, trying to figure out where she was. Evelyn held her hand, which Adeline clutched like a lifeline. Celine touched her shoulder in comfort as the others crowded around her in encouragement. Aubrey still faced the council. Gentlemen, we will not trouble Westholt any longer. We will be gone in two days. The blessed turn is one, and left the room. They decided to go home with the horses and sleigh before the spring came, and they would have to leave the horses here. They began to pack their luggage. Their soldiers had been told by an angry Njal what had happened with the council. When the Duchess tried to see her daughter, she was gently turned away by Aubrey. I'm sorry, Your Majesty, but right now, Adeline needs rest and no stress. I still would like to see her. Her father tells me she was quite upset at the meeting, Isidora explained, trying to figure out how to get around Aubrey. Your Majesty wasn't that upset. Adeline became under the control of her god. She went too close to divinity. She needs to rest and recuperate from her brush with her patronage before our trip back to the manor. But I don't want her to go without resolving this problem with her father. Duchess Isadora put her hands on her hips and glared at the tall girl in a classic mother stance. Aubrey smiled at her. Family is family, milady. Never will she forget that, but the wounds are too sore right now. After all, is the king willing to ask his daughter for forgiveness? Isadora sighed, rubbing her face as she knew her husband was not ready to talk about their daughter. Um, I suppose so, but I wish that no one was going to the manor tomorrow. Aubrey smiled, but when she looked over Isidora's shoulder, it faded. I don't think any of us will be going to the manor. Isidora frowned and looked over her shoulder. She gasped, her hand covering her mouth, as she saw General Ulfric staggering towards them, blood dripping from his mouth, before he collapsed. Move! Adeline ordered as she pushed past Aubrey and her mother. She walked the few feet and knelt in the mud beside the general, who was coughing up blood and phlegm. Adeline laid her hands on either side of his throat and began to concentrate. He laid still, his eyes fluttering closed as he went limp. Isidora choked on a sob as her husband and council members crowded around. They all thought he was dead. Suddenly, the general's eyes snapped open and he bolted upright, spewing blood and phlegm, which Adeline caught in her hand. Her brothers gagged as she examined it. It was black, and thick as tar. It smelt like death itself. Adeline wrinkled her nose before she waved her other hand over it and caused it to turn to regular phlegm. 
She wiped her hands on her the handkerchief Selene handed to her, then turned back to General Ulfric, who was wheezing and staring at her. General, you need to rest. Anyone who has been in contact with you today needs to be kept in isolation. Father, you need to keep these men in one secure area of the city. Mother, you, Freya, and the boys need to go to the country estate. Take no one from here. You must go now. Adeline stood, mud covering her gown as two soldiers helped the general up. She poured whiskey over her hands to cleanse them. She looked at her father, who hadn't moved while she issued orders. You also need to isolate, father. Actually, the entire royal family should stay in several different households to ensure the entire royal family is not wiped out. And what of you? Shouldn't you go into seclusion as well? We can't be killed by a regular plague. Only another god's flesh can kill us, Selene said. Exactly, father. I will be fine. Now please, you've already been exposed. You all must leave. We ride north to the furthest village the general last visited. Please, father, send the royal healers to us while we saddle up. We will borrow some horses. Speed is of the essence. We will leave as soon as possible, and you should send other riders and healers to go to other villages. Adeline smiled at her father sadly. I can do this, Papa. I will save our people, but we have to move quickly. We've already lost too many days. King Bernard frowned at his daughter, hesitating before he relented and sent a soldier to fetch his healers. To the rest of the group of blessed and council members, he made this announcement. We will do as you say. I'll remain in the city, and the others divide into four different households, and anyone who leaves cannot come back in. I will meet with those who intend to remain in the council chambers in one hour. This plague will clog up the airway with a great deal of phlegm. Now be prepared, this is some sorcerer's plague, so symptoms may change. People will likely get sick without notice. Adeline tossed a saddle onto the back of the horse she was borrowing. Aye, princess. How can we stop it, then? The master healer asked, looking left and right, trying to keep his voice down so he didn't cause panic. We will have to watch for commonalities. Then we will know how to defeat it. She turned to him. We will head north to take care of as many people as possible. Send healers to each village and be prepared. People who die from this will need to be burned immediately, not buried where the illness can rest and chance to happen again. Do you understand? Uh, yes, princess. Is there anything else we can do? He followed her from the stables. Stop all contact between villages. Only the healers should enter. Uh, close our borders from the north. Maybe that'll slow it down? And take care of my family? She swung onto her horse. Do not worry too much, Master Healer. You have seven god-blessed fighting this with you. He looked at them. But, Princess, there's only five of you here. She smiled. We're never apart from each other in power of spirit. Good luck, healer.